Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to yet another edition of Overdrive's digital show. And today there's a lot of excitement as well because uh, we've got a special guest uh, who's going to be uh, talking to us and taking a few of your queries as well. Uh, Rajesh Jijurikar, who is the executive director at Mahindra and looks after the auto and farm sector, uh, is also spearheading their EV initiatives that uh, start off starts off its uh, you know another big uh, journey in uh, this year now uh, there's been a lot of uh, announcements in the recent past especially about the last the last mile mobility solutions as well as uh, developing a new tech center that's going to be based out of bangalore uh, and there's some very interesting work happening uh, at their end now since auto expo in uh, 2020 where they did announce a few of those products coming into the market in the ev space we're all very eager i know uh, to see what they're up to. So I'm not going to waste too much time. I'm going to get Rajesh on to the show immediately. And uh, there he is. Good evening, Rajesh. And thank you for being with us on the digital show, on this live digital show. Pleasure. Thanks, Vadi, for having me and pleasure to be with you. So, Rajesh, how's, how's, uh, you know, how's your day? How's your days? Uh, how are these days working out for you? It's a, it's a very it's a very intense moment that we are going through, a uh, very tough time for the auto sector as well as for people at large for that matter. But how, how's your, how interesting are your days these days? Yeah, first, uh, Bertie, I think I have to say, tell everyone that uh, first priority has to be the safety of all our people and all of you. Go out right now only if you need to, but uh, if you can avoid it, please stay in, play, be safe. Uh, because we need to see this through. And if we see this through, then there's a lot of excitement. I think we are at that inflection point where we will see this through because the vaccinations will move into overdrive. If I may borrow your, uh, uh, you know, your caption uh, to take this through uh, and end this part of our phase of our lives, which we never thought will happen. But while we're doing that, we still have to prepare ourselves for a robust future and a strong uh, future. And we've been doing a lot of work over the last year to fortify our auto strategy and put in place all the building blocks for a strong tomorrow. Uh, like you said, the electric is one important part of that. But you know, our brand and strengthening our brand proposition, making our brands more SUV focused. So we are doing a lot of work in that space. All right, super. I just thank you for that message also. And uh, yes, we're all going to uh, try and stay safe, uh, keep ourselves socially distanced, wear masks, everybody out there, uh, reduce your movements wherever you are, reduce your movements, don't head out uh, unless it's absolutely essential. Uh, and let's try and weather this storm that's come our way. Uh, let's, let's get on the other side safer so that there's more uh, excitement coming our way in the future as well. Uh, Rajesh, I'll just quickly get down to it because I know we are uh, very short on time as well. Uh, I have a few questions for you and uh, in time we will take uh, uh, queries from the viewers as well. So do keep posting your queries on the chat boxes on YouTube, on Facebook or on Twitter. Uh, my first question to you now, Rajesh, is uh, you know over the last couple of years now there have been various announcements coming from Mahindra uh, towards electrification as the larger business plan. Uh, shared mobility or personal mobility electrification of existing portfolio, new platforms, a variety of business uh, concepts have been handed about. Now, which of these dynamics would benefit Mahindra as a brand in the long run? Because uh, you are now at the helm of affairs. Uh, what are your thoughts? In which direction are your thoughts leading uh, the group? Yeah, um, but a great question. And um, the way I, we, I and our organization are now thinking about is, if we really want to build a very strong, robust brand, uh, we need to have focus and need to be highly differentiated. For us to have focus and highly be highly differentiated, we really need to go back and see the heritage of our brand and the stories that our brand has been telling and the stories that are very salient to our brand narrative. And when we think about that, we really say come around to saying that the real relevant story is about us being the authentic SUV player. And we really want to hence build our brand on the proposition of being authentic, helping consumers explore the impossible. 
electrification in the personal space is a part of that narrative so when we think about electrification there is one part of our electrification which is related to personal mobility that's going to be in the suv space our focus and priority electrifying creating an electric range of suvs for the future strategy is also about making choices and we are take, making a conscious call to hence not play in the shared mobility space uh, except through last mile mobility which is small three wheelers and small four wheelers uh, that's the commercial segment but in the what we call passenger segment we will play primarily for personal suvs have a range of ic derived electrics and then born electric vehicles so that's broadly the strategy electrification is a part of the brand building strategy is not a stand alone strategy by itself so electrification now you know it, it's not it's not a simple movement for a traditional oem you know because you've got several other responsibilities towards your existing customers uh you know at the same time you you're, you're talking about a cosmic shift an inevitable cosmic shift in terms of the product lines uh, from ic engines which have been around for well over a century or now completely we are we are working towards dismantling that making those redundant and replacing it with an electric motor it's a very simple approach for uh, modern players or contemporary players who just come into the market uh, you know just to side them since it's uh, for instance test now who had a fairly simple uh, simpler journey because they've started off from scratch uh, you know you don't have to worry about legacy uh, ownership and values that you would have to continue providing to ic engine the uh, owners for that matter so how difficult or easy is this transition uh, for mahindra as a company or for any other manufacturer as well from you know the whole uh, ic engine phase to an electric phase yeah uh, so but clearly as a established oem today in the market and like, like you rightly said we have asset base around ic uh, product lines and neither is the market going to shift one day immediately from ic to electric right so it's going to be a phased approach uh both from a legislation point of view we believe but also from a consumer migration point of view so consumers will also move from ic products to electric over time and there are going to be many determinants of that time one determinant of that time is going to be the cost right so as the cost curves improve the penetration for electric will improve the second is availability of charging infrastructure the third is my love for and caring for the planet so when these three things start kicking in it's at that stage that we will see a very rapid move to electric but till then uh, electric will be an option will not be mainstream now it's anybody's guess whether that timeline is going to be a few weeks i mean a few years sorry uh, which means 3 years 5 years 10 years that's one has to wait and watch our sense is that a serious migration to electric will not start till the year 2025 2026 in in india uh, that 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 migration for the personal segment however for the last mile mobility segment we believe that time will be much much faster and which is the reason we've kind of segmented our business into two verticals one which yes. is going to focus on leveraging the short term opportunity which we believe is last mile mobility and the second as you rightly said the ev tech center which prepares us for the future all right so uh, but you know we we uh, in the last few years uh, we we've seen mahindra bring out the e2o you had the e very do uh, you even created a splash at formula e and there's a lot of lessons that you definitely learn from there uh, you know you are at one point in time the favorites for leading india's ev charge uh, but there has been no news on the ev front uh, from the brand for several years uh, this year again or rather i'd say 2020 uh, you know information started coming in from mahindra about your plans for the future as well but um, neither is there a you know long range ev on the price and when and the, you know other players have come in tata motors mg they already come out with their products they already established or rather at least started off establishing themselves as stronger players in the suv space in the e suv space but what are the challenges for mahindra why is it taking you guys so long to come out of the space yeah so uh, but you try and answer that in two parts one is 
we are, are continue to be the pioneers in the last mile mobility commercial space that has been our focus and for the reasons that i just mentioned right that market yes. is ready that segment is ready uh, and we should leverage that opportunity fully while that segment is ready on the personal suv space we have two products in the pipeline which should come in uh, you know in the calendar year uh, next calendar year which is 2022 or all is the EKUV and the EKUV and the EXUV 300 yes. now but that's not going to be the end right and as we've said we are going to invest now serious money and we think this is the right time you know sometimes doing things too early is not necessarily the smartest thing to do especially in an area where technology the technology curve is evolving so much uh, if you're going to launch a whole spectrum of evs in a category and a segment where the market is not yet ready then you really put in a lot of investment in a technology when the market is not fully ready so it's not necessarily the smartest strategy to do and hence we are pacing ourselves to come out with the best possible portfolio of evs at a time we believe the market will be more ready and we think that's going to be three four years from now okay um I'm going to take a few questions from viewers as well. Uh, we've got uh, a few more minutes. Uh, one of the questions that came up earlier uh, this week was, uh, "Why isn't India speeding up the EV ecosystem?" A very important question because there is a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of announcements. There's a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, you know, uh, optics about how the EV ecosystem has to be developed and how the government is doing various things. But it isn't really speeding up the way we want it to, uh, to be. Uh, what are your thoughts on this, Rajesh? um yeah so clearly we need to move much faster on speeding up the electric ecosystem and again i think it will happen and we have to in a country like india we have to give assume that that will take some time uh and which is why at least our assessment right now is by the time infrastructure reaches a level where uh, there will be serious penetration of uh, personal segment vehicles uh, which you know allow you to move long distances into cities so on and so forth our sense is it's going to take about 3 years or maybe more so that's the reason our product strategy is preparing ourselves for 3 to 5 years uh because we believe that's when the penetration will start uh, accelerating and by then we expect infrastructure will be much more ready okay uh another question that we had was um, electric is the future at the same time for a country like us uh, petrol is one of the main sources of revenue uh how can both of these be balanced out from a consumer point of view or from an economy point of view i wasn't sure i got that question uh, i just took it from both sides because you you see both sides of the coin as well yeah so um, which is i you know i think in india for a while we're going to live with both options we are going to live with gasoline as an option and we are going to live with electric and of course there are going to be hybrid solutions so one has to be uh, assume that for a long time we will have both a lot like i said earlier is going to depend on how the cost curve on electric evolves and how do the cost curves on the rest of the fuel fuel types evolve as well so i think one has to play this out with scenarios uh until a time when legislation will come in which completely stops um uh, fossil fuel vehicles i personally don't think that's going to happen probably for the next 7 to 10 years at least that a legislation which comes in which stops fossil fuels right so that means you are going to have consumers as the determinant of which they want to buy and that's going to be dependent like i said on care for the planet there will be one segment yeah. which is going to buy electric because they just care for the planet there's going to be another segment which buys electric uh but depending on the economic sense it makes and uh, if it doesn't make economic sense and i don't care for the planet why am i going to buy it? so you are you are going to have uh, this duality on for a while all right uh the next question we got is uh, one of my favorites actually is mahindra going to launch an electric tractor <laughs> you've done yeah, the driverless you know, uh, uh it's clearly something that we've been looking at buti and i i'm glad somebody's brought up this question because normally you know people don't uh, don't ask in fora like this questions related to tractor so the challenge in tractor when you understand farming more closely is that tractor is actually a prime mover for implement 
things. And uh, a tractor is doesn't do work by itself. It uses a cultivator, rotavator, so on and so forth, as a and hence becomes a prime mover for getting work done. So one of the very important requirements when you're doing that kind of a usage in applications and in a country like India or many parts of the world, that is the primary application. You need a very high level of backup talk. And uh, electric at this point of time, you're not seeing generating that kind of a backup talk, which allows a prime, a prime mover function where a machine or an implement or an attachment is able to work effectively with. There will be niche applications of electric tractors in you know very small horticulture farms where you don't need very you know high intensity work. Uh, but at this point of time, it's that's the reason it's not likely to be mainstream. Uh, I'm going to take a couple more questions. One of them is: Is Pininfarina helping MRV design some of the products in your pipeline? Uh, yeah, we have uh, you know as you know uh, Mahindra. Tech Mahindra and Mahindra are invested in Pinon Farina, but we do work with them as a design partner. Uh, all our new new products have uh, Pinon Farina designs coming in. Uh, and uh, Pinon Farina does compete with our own uh, design studios as well. So it's it's uh, always a bouquet of options that we look at before making a final call on what to do. So I'd assume this would also be involved a lot of the electric, the EVs that are coming in, there'd be a lot of work coming in for Pinon Farina as well. This, uh... That's fine because we've seen the Batista. When are you getting the Batista to India? <laughs> wow, <laughs> that will be interesting. Happy to take the first order. <laughs> just for the so viewers, just for your viewers there. to know, it's priced at two million euros. So happy to. Well, yes, I'm sure some of our viewers out there definitely have the capacity to do this. India is a strange country. We've got yeah. some real, uh, really interesting, uh, you know, sales in in the past, and hopefully, I'm hopeful something uh, extraordinary will happen in the future as well. Uh, I'm going to take one more question, uh, Rajesh, before uh, I let you go for today. Uh, and that is, uh, is Mahindra pl planning to launch a micro EV for the masses, like a two or a four seater? There was some talk about a quarter cycle, not just a three wheeler, yeah, but a quarter cycle. Oh, okay, let, let me correct myself. Uh, we are planning to do this pro product project called Atom. Uh, which yes. is a four-wheeler. We have showcased it at uh, the Auto Expo uh, last year. Uh, and that yeah. is a people mover product, last mile people movement. And uh, we should launch that next year. This is not, as you know, in the COVID times, a great time to launch a people mover. <laughs> I mean, uh, this is really absolutely wrong timing. And possibly this year is going to go in recovering from COVID, especially in that segment where Shared people mobility, as we all understand, is really under pressure. So, right. uh, so, but we do have plans to bring out the atom. Right, perfect. Uh, I'd love to have a long conversation with you, and we'll definitely line that up for some time in the future. I do know you are uh, tied up in meetings today, Rajesh. So, thank you for being with us, uh, answering some of those queries, and uh, we will try and send you a few more questions. And when do you do have the time? And can respond to them. We will, uh, you know, respond to the, to the viewers who are posting those queries. But thank you for your time today, and uh, wish you all the best. Stay safe. Thanks for having me over, Bertie. And I'm, I can see it's looking at the number of questions on the screen coming up. That clearly the 20 minutes we spent together has been woefully short. So would love to come back. <laughs> it's never, uh, it's never another 45 minutes of this, <laughs> and uh, it's it's a it's a fun it's session and. Absolutely. Great to be Absolutely. With you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. See ya. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks, Rajesh. All right, guys. Uh, that was Rajesh Jijunikar. Uh, time was short, unfortunately. Uh, he has to be in another meeting as well, but uh, we're fortunate to have his time and for him to answer some of those queries for us. But uh, moving on, uh, we've now got, uh, well, Rohit actually has got a story for you. He was in Uttarakhand. Uh, he got you the first walk around of the Triumph Trident. A motorcycle that I find uh, quite intriguing and uh, that quite a few of my uh, friends have asked me to get over so that they could also just check it out, see what it is. Uh, I'm looking forward to riding it, but here's Rohit's review of Triumph's new motorcycle, the Trident. In the car world, a cheap car, a cheap premium car, cheap luxury cars even, will make all these car guys shy away because no one really wants to associate themselves with cheap cars or the word cheap. 
Bikers, however, don't have these kind of inhibitions. In fact, bikers won't have a problem with a cheap motorcycle as long as it promises to be a lot of fun. And that is exactly what this cheapest Triumph is all about. The Trident does have some retro cues to it in the round headlamp, the rounded tank, slim forks and the edgy master cylinder. While the Trident does cast a silhouette of a sporty roadster like its counterpart from the 90s, it is tightly packaged and has a lean body structure that the Instagramming Gen Z are likely to appreciate. Now for uh, someone like me who is an average 5'8", it fits quite nicely and even for shorter riders, it's not going to feel bulky or overwhelming. Its 805mm seat height is easy for most riders thanks to its narrow profile. While a fat cushioning and a wide pillion seat ensures that comfort over long distances for two isn't compromised. The handlebars are wider than a street triple to offer better leverage in the city environments, but an early steering lock limits its flexibility for navigating or turning in tight spaces. The handlebars are wider than the Street Triple, almost comparable to the Street Twin, uh, but they are tilted towards the rider a little bit more. Uh, so that with the raised footpeg position gives you a bit of a relaxed yet sporty riding posture, uh, both uh, that you can enjoy in the street, city, as well as winding roads like these. But to mark a clear distinction from the Street Fighter, the Trident goes with a single round headlight with horizontally split LED lamps that work pretty well for city use but not so much for highway. And then there is the matching single round instrumentation with horizontally split displays which are easy to read at all times of the day. The tail section looks the most modern. It has hints of the Street Triple and the Daytona in its pointy end, but the tail light looks a bit more sophisticated with the little Triumph logo embedded in it. It's touches like these in the tank, handlebars and headlights that take the attention away from some of the relatively cheap bits like the switchgear quality or the entry spec suspension and brakes and leave you with a feeling that the Trident is a sophisticated motorcycle, which it largely is. The overall fit and finish are hard to find faults with and generally feel better than the motorcycles that you are likely to be upgrading from. The chassis is suspended by 41mm non-adjustable upside down forks up front and a preload adjustable monoshock at the rear. While I said that the suspension elements feature at the value end of the inventory list, they do their job pretty well. Uh, there is a nice damp feeling to it, both the front and the rear feel harmonious and uh, it gives you a nice supple ride on most of the undulated surfaces that the Indian roads will throw at you. That said, there is a pronounced dive under heavy braking. There's also a bit of squatting when you uh, give this bike some hard acceleration. And what that translates into is that if you were to carry your braking onto a speed breaker or into a pothole, the suspension will bottom out. In fact, in a similar scenario, you're also uh, very likely to scrape the underbelly exhaust, especially on tall speed humps. In fact, the ground clearance will always become a matter of worry if you don't adjust the preload for the pillion and the luggage. The braking hardware comes from the value crate too featuring sliding type Nissan calipers at the front and the rear. On a cold start this morning, the brakes never felt worrisome. They feel nice in the city. The brake uh, lever feel is also quite nice. It's progressive. And even a day long ride in these mountain roads, they never really felt that, uh, you know, they had some kind of a fade or that spongy or the wooden feel. All of that wasn't there. So no real room for complaint. However, if you were to take this motorcycle to the occasional track day, after a few hot laps, the brakes might feel inadequate. The engine won't disappoint no matter where you are riding, street, mountains or the track. This 660cc engine is derived from the Daytona, but apart from the platform design and engineering, it has little in common with the legendary 675. That said, most of the internals have been revised, reworked, completely new components, cams, pins, the pistons, the heads, the intake, everything is new on this particular engine. But even on the move, the triple sounds just as enticing as you expect it to be. In Take a listen.
Compared to either of these siblings, it has a different intake system too to achieve that narrow seat and tank geometry. But the intake wine doesn't feel very different than its bolder siblings and onlookers will hear the pleasant whistling sound of a triple. The powertrain also features a slip and assist clutch which makes for a lighter clutch lever feel and there's hardly any hopping under harsh downshifting. The gearbox feels a bit clunkier than my Daytona though and I strongly recommend opting for the slick bi-directional quick shifter if you are into sport riding. This new engine also features ride by wire which enables two riding modes, a dull rain and a peppy road mode, a first for this segment. Apart from the eagerness of the throttle, they also alter the alertness of the always-on ABS and the switchable traction control system. Now the road mode, it's nice and playful, just like the 81 horses that this engine churns out. And the gearing is short and that gives you a nice quick acceleration, much quicker than what the specs otherwise suggest. Our test in these hilly regions show a 0 to 100 time of 4.6 seconds, which is only about a second slower than our Street Triple R timings near the coast. Triumph also says that the Trident will ride past 200 km an hour if you so wish, though I believe it will take a while to get there. But the takeaway is that the Trident never really feels underpowered. Ride any of the older 600s on winding roads like these and you might agree that they can get intimidating at times because of the weight, because of the fueling, because of the way they accelerate. The Trident doesn't feel like any of that. The bike feels nice and light, the acceleration feels nice and smooth, the power delivery is linear and the fueling feels spot on. The throttle isn't choppy and maintaining a clean line through the corner is never too challenging because the power never feels overwhelming unless you are riding on a death wish. The power delivery is exceptionally smooth and the meat of the power lies between the 3000 to 8000 rpm mark. But the short gearing and a healthy spread of torque between the 3 to 9000 rpm mark makes the Trident extremely forgiving to wrong gear selections. You can exit tight corners in 4th if you like, potter around town in 5th at 40 to 50 km an hour without any knocking from the engine and even pull overtakes in 5th. The tractability is that good. Part of these handling niceties also come from the Michelin Pilot Road 5 tyres, which have impressed us in the past on motorcycles of various shapes and sizes. They are known for their exceptionally good grip and some street triple owners who are using these tell us that their tyres have lasted over 10,000 kilometres. That said, you could run out of grip from this rubber at extreme leans. Also on some of the stretches of the Dehradun roads, which have mixed shredded plastic with the bitumen for a new cost-effective model, these tyres were losing grip quite abruptly. When the Triumph Street Twin came out, it left me impressed for many reasons. At the same time, it did not evoke the kind of emotions that the original Bonneville did for me. Somewhere, it felt a bit of a compromise in its size and its feel. But the Trident doesn't do any of that. It feels like it's cut from the same fabric as a Street Triple. It also feels like it's dyed in the same wool, has that same attitude towards fun. And that is what makes it so special. In fact, it doesn't feel like a compromise at all. More importantly, it doesn't feel like an entry-level model at all. There's a lot more character to it and one that is very likeable. Well, there you had a uh, very interesting story from Rohit. I'm going to get him on the show. He is unfortunately also suffering from a sore throat. So guys, don't uh, bombard him with too many queries. He's not in a position to answer all of them. I have no idea what he's been up to, but uh, he's got a sore throat. Uh, well, just, just shooting a lot, Bert. Uh, just testing too many vehicles in the heat and then also getting back into the AC. So, right. yeah, not complaining about that, but yeah, but that, that's I been a bit of a... Completely. I completely. I went out for a shoot yesterday. I came back with a splitting migraine. And I just had to walk myself out for like a couple of hours before I could uh, surface and get back to normal. Yeah, but yeah hot, right? it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, terrible out there, guys. Everyone, all of our viewers, again... Uh, just keep in mind that uh, we are not away from the threat of COVID. It's still bad. So mask up, sanitize, maintain your distance. Uh, we are effectively going to stop shooting. I'm not sure how we're going to get you content out next week on the digital show or what we're going to be getting out uh, for you. But we are effectively stopping our shoots as of today. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we're still trying to give you some content uh, next week. But let's see what, uh, what we've got, uh, what we can rustle up for you. In the meantime, there are a few queries, I think, uh, that have come away. Rohit, uh, one of them, of course, is uh, from Apurva Chetty, who's asking us, how is the quality of materials on the Trident 660? Any signs of cost-cutting? 
Uh, well, Apur, like I mentioned in the review, uh, you know, in terms of the build, in terms of the fit and finish, it feels just like a triumph. You know, you go up to the higher triumphs. Uh, I'm not even uh, talking about the street wins. Even if you go higher up, uh, you know, something like a street triple, uh, the, the quality is comparable. It's just that good. Each and every panel, uh, you know, it's put together very nicely. There are no inconsistent panel gaps here and there. Uh, the only bit of, uh, you know, uh, cheap material that I could find, I not even say material, uh, you know, uh, the only bit where I could see some cost cutting was if you look at, uh, you know, the master cylinder uh, for the front brake, uh, it's that, you know, that old school, uh, typical matchbox kind of a master cylinder, something that uh, we've seen on, uh, you know, the hero on the charisma, uh, you know, something like that. So that's, that's the only bit uh, that is cost. Uh, and of course, if you uh, were to compare, uh, you know, the, the the model of the brakes used or the models of the uh, suspension used from Sh uh, Showa compared to, uh, you know, what you've seen on the higher end triumphs, uh, of course, this is from the value crate, like uh, this is uh, on the more value end of things. Uh, but in terms of the performance of these brakes, uh, it doesn't feel like a compromise anyway. In fact, the motorcycle doesn't feel like a compromise at all. Uh, in fact, if you were to, uh, you know, literally ride the older uh, Street Triple and this new Trident back to back, you would feel a lot of resemblance between these two motorcycles in terms of how the engine feels, in terms of how the power delivery is. And then the Trident actually comes out a little bit on top because of the electronics uh, that uh, it brings along uh, that gives you a slightly better safety net as well. So it doesn't feel like a compromise anywhere, which is why I've said uh, even in the full version of the review, if you've uh, watched it or read it, uh, that, uh, you know, instead of buying a, a used a pre-owned street triple for about uh six six and a half lakh rupees i would say stretch and try and get yourself the trident because it's just a nicer package overall and uh, that is that's exactly how i would sum it i mean it's it's a brilliant uh, starter uh, big bike if this is going to be your first big bike uh, after uh, you know riding the 200s 250s or 390s you want to upgrade to uh, something that is a bit more powerful this is a very good step uh, in that direction All right uh we got another. Uh, Apura has also asked another question. Tires losing grip abruptly could be because these are factory fresh tires. Possibly yes, because they were factory fresh in the car. The motorcycle just uh, uh, no. Factory. I wouldn't. I won't actually uh, say that because these are factory fresh tires. Because uh, you know the first initial about 100, 150 kilometers, we were going easy. Uh, and when I said abruptly, it is that one particular section of the road. And you know this is something that I really want to research on. Uh, so uh, even Bert might uh, have some uh, inputs here because. Uh, I came to know, I, I spoke to a few people there in Dehradun and I came to know that that particular road, uh, that piece of road that we were all complaining about, uh, that road has been, I mean, uh, the government there, the authorities there, they've been trying out a new uh, uh, kind of a mixture for the road. They're mixing plastic uh, with uh, yeah, the bitumen for uh, these particular stretches of the road. It's a new cost effective model is what they say. Uh, and I don't know if something, uh, you know, is uh, uh, it's something got to do with that. but. Uh, Another interesting bit is uh, because the, the the loss of grip was so abrupt and so alarming in a way, because just before that we were shooting and, uh, you know, uh, there were some stretches where we could almost get our knee downs easily and these are public roads, so we would uh, certainly not do that or advise anyone to do that. But that was the level of grip uh, that these roads were offering. And just 20 kilometers later, suddenly uh, a piece of uh, road that looks so inviting and nice, uh, you know, you're losing grip very abruptly there. Uh, so I don't know if it's something to do with that new mixture that they're trying out. Uh, but one thing that I uh, was very alarmed about was, uh, you know, just to uh, take a look at the motorcycle and understand if everything was right with the motorcycle. I pulled over uh, and everything seemed nice. And, uh, you know, I don't know what uh, went in my mind, but I, I took off my glove and you just I, I just tried to feel the road. And, uh, you know, at 2.30 in, in the afternoon, uh, you are expecting the road, the tarmac to be hot. I mean, it's so hot that you shouldn't uh, be able to touch it. But these roads were not that hot. They were like barely warm. Which is what was a little, uh, you know, alarming because at 2.30 in the afternoon, the road can't be just barely warm, especially when you're sweating, uh, sweating it out, you know. So that was a, a bit alarming for us. And that is where the whole conversation started. And I spoke to the other journalists who were uh, with us on the ride, uh, including some of the ex uh, overdrive fellows like Abhay. And everyone had that same problem on that very stretch of road that even on the straights, even if you would give a little bit of throttle, the tail would just, you know, snap out. And uh, that's with the traction control working. And mind you, Triumph has one of the most sensitive traction control systems. And still that was happening. So something was not wrong. Uh, something was not right on that particular stretch of road. Something was definitely wrong. Visually, nothing uh, that we could identify. So, yeah, uh, this is still a mystery for us.
Well, you, you are talking a lot for having a sore throat, but uh, let me just come back to you with some information also on this. Now, this is uh, this program because these these roads uh, where plastic shredded plastic is being used. Now, there are several projects that are already being undertaken in India. Uh, in fact, there are some projects that uh, one of the first earliest projects was, from what I understand, was in Chennai, uh, and uh, they're trying this out in Bombay and some other cities as well. But BRO, the Border Roads Organization, has been undertaking this uh, project as well. They've been experimenting with this in some of the border states as well. So I think uh, Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand are part of that uh, uh, part of a few states. Where uh, the BRO is constructing roads, where the top layer is going to be used uh, with along or there's a blend of tarmac, uh, bitumen, and uh, shredded plastic. So this, yeah, this is this. It's quite possible that you are probably riding on uh, one of those surfaces, uh, Rohit. And uh, I again, not sure what uh, the far-flung effects of this would be, but uh, we'll know in some time just how effective. It's a low-cost project. But how effective is it towards safety? Uh, we are not sure at this point in time. So let's see. I am sure it will come up uh, in uh, the months to come. All right. Um, moving on. I'm going to take, of course, now that there's, there's still several queries that are coming up that have come up on uh, the EV sector. Uh, I'm not going to take all of those today. We are, uh, in fact, we are actually going to move across to the news and we're going to wait for a few. Um, yeah, let me get on to the news today and we're going to start off, of course, with uh, the 2021 uh, Volkswagen Polo. If you can just pick up those images, we can have the visuals. There you go. That's the new Polo. Now, this uh, has been showcased and this is largely for Europe. Uh, an India spec version will also come down to India. Now, uh, this, however, is not going to be coming anytime soon. Uh, Volkswagen India's Immediate plans are, of course, to establish that SUV line, which will be spearheaded by the Tiguan uh, and the Tiguan and the, Tig uh, the Tiguan All Space, and of course the Tiro. All of once those are established, and that project will go on till I guess mid 2022. Um, at which time also there will be a little more focus on the next generation uh, Vento or other the sedan. Let me not call it the Vento, but the next generation sedan. Uh, the notchback sedan that will come onto the market, both uh, Skoda and Volkswagen will be releasing it. But here are the first images of the Volkswagen Polo. Like I said, soon after all of that is done, including the new sedan, Volkswagen will definitely be looking at this. From what I understand from having conversations with Volkswagen, they are certainly looking at bringing the Polo back down to India. This will be a few revisions on this. Uh, we're expecting to see the one litre power trim. Uh, come into effect again in this new Polo with the DHG transmissions and there will be several variants as well. Looks nice, looks contemporary. Uh, you can see the same lines on this hatchback like you'll see in the new line of SUVs that they've come up with as well. Uh, again, if you look clearly at the, at the rear, where we just see the Tiger, it's got that one sweeping line running across from tail lamp to tail lamp, which is an LED strip. In this, it's got the split uh, strip but all of it looks pretty interesting, looks pretty nice. So that's the that's the Volkswagen Polo. You can also head down to the Overdrive website. We've got a lot more information about the Polo for you. Uh, coming up next, we've had the Shanghai Motor Show, the Shanghai Auto Show that uh, that is going on. That's, that's still uh, taking place right now in China. But there have been uh, some big announcements and some big reveals coming up from there. I'm going to start off with the, I'm just going to talk about a few of them. First of course is the Toyota, the BZ4X, the EV concept. Now this is a preview to the brand's first production battery electric car. Keep in mind Toyota's larger agenda till now was a lot of focus on hybrids, but now this is only a big push towards EV. Uh, that's what uh, in the concepts in the BZ stands for Beyond Zero or uh, their electrification strategy through which it will launch 15 pure electric vehicles. Uh, this will go across the world by 2025, which means India will also be somewhere in this plan. Maybe not by 2025, maybe a little later, but something or other will certainly come into India from this new uh, strategy. Now, the BZ4X is being co-developed with Subaru. Uh, which is a big thing because Subaru is one of the masters where dynamics are concerned, uh, making some of those most exciting, very, very exciting, very dynamic uh, sports sedans. 
uh, and it sits on a completely new ETNGA architecture. Now, this is uh, Toyota's global architecture, again, which is a very modular platform that accommodates a host of cars or other uh, top hats on it. And this has been, but this one has been, this ETNGA uh, architecture has been specially developed for uh, EVs. This SUV will come equipped with a new electric all wheel drive system, which means it will have power delivered to all four wheels with individual motors running the front and the act, uh, rear axles. Uh, this again will be developed in conjunction with Subaru. And what's impressive is that it will come with a solar recharging system that will work in union with the regeneration system to add to the SUV's range. The Toyota has one of Toyota's large uh, areas of focus has always been to extend range to provide maximum range that they can. And both the solar charging along with uh, the brake rejuvenation all of this will kind of add to the range or other and reduce range anxiety for their consumers. Uh, other big news coming up from uh, the auto show is one of my favorites. And of course, this is the Audi A6 e-tron concept. What a gorgeous looking sedan. That car looks absolutely fantastic. Now, there are certain aspects of it that I think, uh, you know, resemble very closely the Jaguar I-Pace. If you look at the lower end of the car, the side profile, you see that uh, strip running across from the top of the length of the car. Well, that looks a little Jaguarish. But on the whole, this is a stunning car. Absolutely gorgeous. I haven't seen an Audi in a very long time. Look this nice. I'm quite looking forward to this coming out uh, in the market very, very soon. Uh, keep in mind, there are lots of new innovative features again. What is the 800 volt electric architecture that's been co-developed? by Audi and Porsche. It's called the Premium Platform Electric. Again, this will uh, drive a range of cars in the Audi and the Porsche stables. The big highlights of this, of course, is that 700 kilometer plus range. And of course, the 0 to 100 uh, time of uh, under about, or rather around, somewhere about 4 to 7 seconds. These are going to be some of the, these are going to be some of the high points of this car, but the more important aspect is that Audi says that this car will be able to recharge itself about uh, close to about 80 percent or rather give you a, a 50 percent or give you a range of about 300 kilometers in just about 10 minutes. Now, this is something that's developing. There are more and more fast charging solutions coming up. There are several players around the world who are working on this uh, and trying to make cars or rather enable that game, you know, empower them to charge much faster. This is what they're going to see. Uh, so this is the A6 uh, e-tron concept. Again, one of uh, one of the highlights was it's uh, very low, 0 0.22 uh, CD drag coefficient, which is marginally more aerodynamically efficient than the 0 0.23 CD of the Tesla Model 3, again, which is coming down to India. Now, in addition, at Shanghai Motor Show, we also had the Mercedes-Benz, the EQB, and the C-Class long wheel base. Now, close to the heels of the EQS, that's, uh, that's again another uh, very, very interesting sedan that Mercedes-Benz recently unveiled. We've got the EQB. This is another compact uh, SUV with an all-electric platform. Uh, again, this is derived on the GLB SUV. Now, the EQB shares its underpinnings with the EQA platform, and it will come with numerous, ba numerous battery and uh, output options globally, depending on the market and its requirements. Uh, this EV, again, will make its debut first in China, in a seven-seater, guys, and then will be available in its EQB 350 formatic, guys, which uses a dual-motor setup to make a combined 292 PS. Now, the European versions will debut later uh, this year, and again, with a lot of choices in both power and output uh, trips. Uh, some One of those is going to be that 66.5 uh, uh, kilowatt hour battery pack which will uh, deliver about 272 PS of max power and give a range of about 470 to 480 kilometers, depending on uh, that's according to the NEDC cycle. Now, again, both front and rear wheel drive options are rather front and all wheel drive options will be available. And uh, the EQB can charge itself at 100 kilowatts and get from 10 to 80% charge in 30 minutes via fast charger. But again, like I mentioned earlier, as charging systems improve, uh, this charging time will become shorter and shorter. Now. The GLB is not in the cards for India, so it's unlikely its electric version will make it to India. But again, we never know Mercedes-Benz. India has got a huge product portfolio lined up uh, both this year and next year. There are about three products coming to India this year. Of course, uh, the EQP may not be there this year, but of course, let's, let's look forward to 2022. It perhaps could make an appearance here as well. Now, alongside the EQB, 
Mercedes Benz also showcased the new generation, the long wheelbase version of the C Class, uh, and it uh, it's now gotten uh, 89 mm longer. The wheelbase has grown 89 millimeters longer. Now, while this uh, long wheelbase variant is initially being showcased exclusively for the China market. Uh, it's quite possible that it will also make an appearance down in India, given that Series Benz, a lot of its products, they're now really, really pushing the uh, space agenda, or the space as the next uh, frontier for luxury in their cars. They're really pushing that agenda forward very strongly. So it's quite possible that we see the long wheelbase version of the C-Class coming down to India very soon. Uh, I'm going to take a few questions just now, and uh, let me just quickly move over. Yeah, sorry. Have you picked out a few questions that we could? Uh, will Volkswagen India? Nitin Joshua has got a question. Will Volkswagen India skip the current generation Polo altogether in India? Uh, Nitin, we are not entirely sure if uh, Volkswagen will skip the current generation Polo altogether. Like I said, all of their plans for the Polo will only emanate for India. Will only emanate post 2022, which is mid 2022. Uh, there will be nothing before that. So this current generation Polo that we are seeing just now, the new generation Polo we are seeing just now. Uh, that will definitely make its way to India. In what shape, in what, uh, with what options, we're not clear at this point in time. But yes, it will come down to India. That Polo still continues to remain a strong product line for Volkswagen, uh, and uh, there is undoubt, there is, there is no, no doubt that it will continue to remain one of their biggest movers. So it will come down to India. Not this year, like I said. Not uh, mid of next year. Maybe sometime mid to uh, late in 2022 is when they will explore that option. Uh, right. Uh, a lot of new questions coming in today, which is which is great also in a way because it uh, gives us some time to look at uh, the other aspects. Rohit, you want to take up uh, the motorcycle news? Yes, I can do that. Uh, in fact, uh, producer, if we can have the visuals. Uh, and I, I believe uh, Apurv asked, is Soini okay? Yes, Soini is absolutely fine. She is our producer for the day because unfortunately our producer is showing a few symptoms uh, of uh, COVID-19. So we are hoping that he is fine. Uh, but yeah, Soini is running the back end today. Uh, so Soini, if we can have the visuals of the motorcycle news. Uh, so essentially, uh, we know that Triumph has uh, you know updated its entire modern retro uh, segment. Uh, it started off with uh, the Street Twin. Uh, the Bonnevilles got, a, got an update as well. And now, uh, even the the Scramble 900 has been given that update. Uh, so you get uh, three new paint schemes. You get the updated engine, which is now BS6 Euro 5 compliant. Uh, there are a few uh, changes here and there, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the kind of bezels that it uses. So it's uh, more to do with the with the color schemes, uh, so to say, than uh, you know outright performance. It's still uh, essentially pushing out a similar kind of power and torque. Uh, so in terms of rideability, I don't expect many changes there. Uh, but yeah, it uh, it has a few visual updates, which makes makes it look fresher. Uh, there are three new color schemes as well, and uh, those color schemes really look good, especially the one that you see on the screen. I think it looks nice. Uh, it also gets this uh, brushed aluminum finish on some of the parts, including this new number plate uh, on the on the small panel uh, that you have on the screen right now. On the left hand side, uh, you will uh, get that uh, panel. So it's very similar to what we've seen Ducati do with its Scrambler lineup, and essentially that's. Uh, the 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 target uh, for uh, this particular vehicle it's going to go up against Ducati's Scrambler lineup and uh, you know I think it looks quite good and quite well poised to do that. There's also a Sandstorm edition uh, which is a limited edition which gets you uh, uh, you know a different color scheme again. Uh, it also has uh, you know that high riding uh, mud flap. Uh, there's a headlamp grille. So again visual changes here and there, uh, but I think it looks very smart. It's a limited edition. Uh, it will certainly come to uh, India as well. Uh, in fact, uh, we are told that the the bigger scramblers may or may not uh, come to India, but the smaller scramblers are likely to uh, continue doing duty in the Indian market as well. And uh, knowing that they have open bookings for the bigger scramblers, uh, Steve, uh, the Steve McQueen edition uh, with six units allocated for India, I'm guessing even the Sandstrom uh, could make it to the Indian market in uh, limited quantities, of course, because it is a globally limited model. Uh, moving on, uh, we also have news from the Bajaj stable. The NS125 has been launched. Uh, it sits uh, next to the, the Pulsar 125, of course, uh, and uh, it looks exactly similar to the NS. Uh, what you see on the screen is the Pulsar 125. Unfortunately, we don't have images of the NS125, but uh, the NS uh, looks different, of course. it's It's got a slightly sharper, leaner, and uh, more compact design. 
and it gets a 125 cc engine which puts out 12 ps of power and 11 newton meters of torque mated to a five speed gearbox and the bike has been launched at 93690 rupees uh, in fact i just made a mention to the hero on the charisma a little while back uh, while we were talking about the trident and i remember i paid lesser money for a charisma when i bought it about 15 years ago uh, or little uh, more than that and today you have a 125 at 93,000 rupees X showroom. So you're going to be play, paying close to a lakh for a 125. But the NS25 is a perfectly nice product. If you don't want to uh, go with a 150 or a 200 and you want to start off with a 125, I think it's a very nice power commuter in that sense. Uh, relatively pa power compared to the 100, 110cc uh, options out there. Uh, so that's uh, essentially the motorcycle news. Uh, we also have some bit of news uh, from Ola because, uh, like I said, the Ola electric uh, scooter uh, is uh, you know on the horizon and uh, it always uh, keeps coming back into news almost every week. Uh, but the uh, the big news this week is that uh, Ola is looking at setting up a hypercharger network, uh, and they they are looking at doing that in the next five years. They are investing close to two billion dollars uh, in this particular project, and they'll set up one lakh charging points in the next five years. And uh, just the way Bert uh, mentioned about uh, the new Audi A6 e-tron, uh, you're talking about, you know, short charging times with uh, these superchargers. And that's something similar that Ola is also looking at uh, where, you know, you don't have to spend too much time charging the vehicle if uh, your commutes are going to be longer. Now, are you going to use an electric scooter for long distance commuting? I'm not sure. Uh, only time uh, will tell. But uh, yeah, I mean, this is a right step uh, in the right direction. Uh, just the way someone uh, asked us earlier uh, in today's show, uh, you know, why is everyone waiting for the government to set up uh, the infrastructure? The manufacturers should take the initiative. And here's Ola doing exactly that. Uh, so we'll try and get you more information on the scooter as uh, time progresses. We are in talks with Ola to uh, try and uh, get a closer look at this uh, scooter that is being planned for the Indian market. So if that materializes, depending on uh, how things are going right now, I don't know when and uh, how that will happen. But if that materializes, we'll try and get you a closer look at what to expect uh, from this Ola electric scooter. But that uh, essentially wraps up the, the two-wheeler news uh, for the week. Uh, but do we have any questions uh, regarding the two-wheelers? But you're on mute. But you're on mute. I'm mute, sorry. sorry. Okay. Now, producer, back end. She's not used to handling the back end today, so <laughs> she's kept you mute. But uh, coming back, we've got some, yes, uh, something that I missed out on entirely, and that is uh, the new Ferrari 812 Superfast uh, Special Edition, which is unnamed as yet. There's, they did not name this car. They will be naming this car very, very soon. It's just a few days away. Uh, but uh, you can take a guess and uh, try and figure out what you think they would call this car. But this is going to be one or other the most uh, powerful V12 that Ferrari has developed in any of their cars to date. Uh, Ferrari says that the power has been increased by about 30 PS to about 830 PS. So that makes it the most powerful production engine they've ever produced. Uh, it's also very, very quick. Uh, it does. It is expected to do a time 0 to 100 uh, under 2.9 seconds. I'm expecting to see this about 2.7 or 2.6 seconds. So they're going to shave off two tenths of what uh, the 800 Superfast can do, which is 2.9 seconds. But uh, 2.6, 2.7 is where I see this car uh, hitting that mark. But uh, overall, let's let's talk about what else this car has got. Uh, the engine now, they've, uh, uh, Ferrari has raised the rev limiter by about 600 revs to 9,500 RPM, uh, which also makes it the highest revving Ferrari ever, quickest revving ever as well. Uh, and uh, they've also cut down the weight. Uh, they've cut down uh, the 1630 curve weight figure on uh, the 812. Well, that has been reduced as well. So it's going to be lighter. It's going to be more agile. It's got a lot more features coming in. There's some very interesting stuff. Slip control, rear wheel steer. Uh, it's going to be an amazing car. Ferrari lovers out there and those of you who can afford, of course, afford to buy a Ferrari, well, uh, go ahead, check it out. I think this should be one of the very, very exciting new cars coming out from Ferrari in this year. I'm not sure if we will be able to get our hands on it as of yet, but uh, rest assured, I'm making every attempt to see what happens in this direction. We will have a lot more information coming to you on the 812 Superfast. It says there the world premieres on the May 5th, so we'll know exactly what it's called. Uh, they've got a special moniker for it as well, so we'll know what that is. But uh, May 5th, that's when we're going to have a lot more information about this all new car coming out from Ferrari. So there you go, that's the Ferrari bit that I missed out. And uh, taking a few more queries, do we have anything more for the day? I'm just taking a quick look. 
um, but there was one question that I wanted to take uh, earlier, and uh, I will uh, take this time. Just looking for it. It's gone somewhere up in. Uh, yeah, uh, this one comes from uh, Parag Adkar. Uh, if I may ask, as Indian manufacturers, can we also concentrate on tier two and below cities, as in rural areas? Uh, fuel reachability is still challenging. Uh, Parag, uh, just to answer your query. Uh, I'm sure every attempt will be made uh, to electrify or rather to make sure in an EV environment, uh, almost every NCT, every city, town, village is looked at uh, very thoroughly and that uh, every uh, facility that has to be provided uh, will, be, will, be, will be provided to you. Uh, keep in mind, this shift to EVs is not a small shift. Uh, it involves every single owner, potential owner, across the globe uh, so every uh, solution that has to be provided uh, will be will be dealt with and uh, there is so yes tier 2 whether it's tier 2 tier 3 uh, rural towns and areas they will all be taken care of there will be an EV infrastructure charging put uh, charging infrastructure put into place uh, this will be made available uh, if not there will be other solutions as well that will be available and uh, just keep in mind it will be a still simpler uh, also, in terms of having uh, to develop or put uh, charging stations, you can do it at your own village, in your own home, in your own towns. Uh, fairly simpler than having to, you know, uh, set up a, a, a petrol station, a fuel station at this point in time. So, in that sense, the infrastructure set up is a little simpler. But yes, it, uh, there are a few challenges that it needs. And one of them, of course, is seamless uh, power supply. Uh, that's one of the biggest challenges that we're facing as a nation today. We need seamless power supply across the nation, even to date. And correct me if I'm wrong, Rohit, but there is still load shedding that keeps happening in Pune as well. If I'm mistaken, manager Thursdays, there isn't power for what, half the day? Yes, that's true. I mean, some areas, uh, Thursdays, it's still at least four to five hours of uh, load shedding does happen in a few areas. And uh, yeah, it's still, it's still happening. Yeah, so I guess uh, power supply or rather delivery of uh, power is going to be the bigger challenge challenge over here, making sure that every nook and corner of this country has electric supply and that it can take care of the EV infrastructure that will come up uh, in some time. Uh, Rahul Samel has a very interesting observation. MNM being the largest, of course, the question that I've already asked, but MNM being the largest manufacturer of tractors, any plans for EV tractors as electricity for farming is subsidized? Rahul, if you watch the interview, uh, Rajesh has answered that they're definitely looking at something or other in the in the farm sector as well. Do you see India from Din Joshua again? Do you see India becoming a major EV export hub? Well, uh, Josh, this is I think a very important question and uh, probably something that we should have seen earlier because we could have put out uh, we could have put this question forward to Mahindra. Uh, one of the reasons why we are a fairly large export hub for a lot of manufacturers today is because of our low cost of production. Uh, we're able to produce cars uh, at very cheap rates and then, of course, export them to other countries. Uh, and this is a fairly good and viable business model. But where EVs are concerned, there are a lot of uh, elements that we need to import. And I'm not sure just how much more effective uh, will uh, the cost of production be where EVs are concerned. Will it really make sense to kind of, you know, uh, export those products? Uh, again, all of these are future developments. We don't know how the business model will work out for manufacturers. We have to wait and see. Keep in mind, a lot of uh, EV uh, uh, elements are, uh, or rather, they come in from China, from Taiwan, from uh, various other countries in the Asian market, and certain other products coming from Europe as well. So we are still dependent on importing a few of those. Then, of course, assembly happens over here, manufacturing will happen, and then these will go out. But we are still dependent for a for key, uh, for very critical components in an EV. We are still dependent on imports, uh, and that may not entirely be uh, the well. It may not be the game changer for India as an export hub. Right. Guys, up next. Uh, Right, we're going to announce our winners uh, from today's show, and uh, they aren't too many, to be honest, but uh, there are definitely a couple of questions that uh, we had received, uh, and uh, I'll just tell you what those are. Give me a second, please, guys, to just go through those. Again, lots of queries that are coming. Uh, 
you're going to have to correct this. Congratulations, top finders. We are not getting as many questions, uh, as many interesting queries, and not every week. Uh, last week also we had just one winner, and this week again we got few uh, few winners, fewer than five rather. Uh, one of course is Subhanshu 2008 who asked a query about um, to Mahindra if there were any plans for an electric tractor. Uh, I think fairly interesting because that's a space that not too many have got a solution for, and Mahindra definitely is looking at that. That was that was a very very good question. Uh, the other query that I've got uh, that I think we should pick out. I'm just looking for those from what we had asked today. Uh, they go where they go. So there's been quite a few queries, and uh, one of them was right. Here you go. Uh, the two questions are actually: Why doesn't India speed up in the electric car ecosystem? Uh, that's another very pertinent question. Country definitely needs to speed up its uh, charging, its, its speed up building its charging infrastructure, and then of course getting the products out faster and faster. If you want to move to an EV ecosystem, so yes, again very pertinent question. And the next question again: uh, Electric is the future. At the same time, for a country like us, petrol is one of the main revenues. How is this going to be balanced out uh, for the auto industry? Again, a very important question. So I think these are three of the top queries that we had today. Apart from this, uh, I'm just going through our list of queries to see if there were anything else. Uh, well, I guess those three are the top questions for today, guys. Uh, and we're going to keep uh, asking you to send in your queries, and uh, we'll keep taking those and seeing what we can do. Now, winners. Uh, so he's put up those three winners: that Subhanshu 2008, AJS Akash, and Shri KY01. You've got a free subscription to the Overdrive Digital Magazine. It's an annual subscription. It will start from the next issue, which in this case would be the May 2021 issue. So you will start getting that uh, in your uh, mailbox. So keep an eye for that. Uh, in the meantime, also do please drop us an email, guys, at digitalshow at overdrive dot four dot in, so that we can uh, we can streamline this process and make sure those subscriptions reach you in time all right uh, before we sign out today uh, let me just uh, draw your attention to tomorrow's uh, show on cnbc tv 18 uh, where you can catch the trident 660 review that's what you just uh, some of you have seen it over here and those of you who missed out can definitely head to cnbc tv 18 again tomorrow in addition we've also got the facelift that's in ready go road test a complete road test with the ready go and we've got highlights from the Shanghai Motor Show as well. So tomorrow, overdrive at 1 p.m. Sunday at 12:30 p.m. at 12:30 p.m. and 8 p.m. on CNBC TV 18. Uh, also, do watch out, uh, keep an eye out uh, for uh, CNBC TV 18 live TV as well. We've got the show that streams live there. Uh, you can also continue to watch us on Facebook, follow us on Facebook on Overdrive, uh, uh, or at Odi Mag, Twitter at Odi Mag, and of course, uh, stay tuned to our Instagram channel. We have a lot more updates coming your way. Again, uh, last and a uh, parting message from me and the guys at Overdrive to all of you out there stay safe, maintain social distances, uh, keep sanitizing yourself, and uh, try and reduce contact with uh, people around. Uh, just let's brave this and let's get over this COVID storm. Uh, we are in a terrible situation right now, and uh, well, the less, the fewer of us moving out and around, going out and about, uh, the fewer chances of us catching. Uh, the virus. So do stay safe and uh, I'll see you next week. Bye-bye for now.